Look back among the recent champions of Australia's top motor racing series, and you'll see some great names with some great stats. Scott McLaughlin in the midst of a record-setting year. Jamie Winkup, the most successful driver of all time. Shane Van Gisbergen and Mark Winterbottom, reliable drivers with exceptional consistency. James Courtney, the unlucky battler who ekes out wins in awful machinery. Garth Tander, who was so good for so long for so many teams. Russell Engel, the enforcer, whose meagre stats belied his ability to intimidate and battle. Marcus Ambrose, the man who could have had it all. Mark Scaife, the aggressive maestro, and Craig Lowndes, the greatest of the modern era. There's one man, though, between a suite of legends, who many feel doesn't deserve to be there. After all, what sort of champion fails to win a race for seven years? There's a reason, though, why Rick Kelly lifted the big trophy, and not just because of the whole Honda Corner incident. Kelly showed talent in local junior formula series before making his debut, a retirement at the 2001 Queensland 500 driving with Nathan Pretty, the car not actually turning a wheel in the race. His main game V8 Supercars debut came later that year at Sandown for the Holden Racing Team's Young Lions program, achieving a top 10 in the final race as his brother Todd won his first ever round for Kmart Racing. He began to show his promise the next season as he overcame teething issues to get Holden Young Lions' first and only podium at Pukekohe and a fourth place at Bathurst. He was promoted to Kmart as Todd was promoted to the Holden Racing Team, and his first race win was a convincing Bathurst win that year with Greg Murphy. 2004 brought his most successful season, four wins, including Bathurst, and a further three podiums. His first solo win was a blitzing of the field at Eastern Creek in the pouring rain, and sixth in the championship was fitting for a great, but slightly wayward year. However, a team rebrand meant more teething issues to overcome. So, despite a winless 2005 campaign, his end of year form was ominous. No lower than 6th place over the last 8 races. One important thing for Kelly was that the points format changed for 2006. Maximum point rewards were reduced, gaps between positions shrunk, and the format overall encouraged consistency over outright race wins. This suited Kelly's new style very well indeed, and he made the most of a battle between the informed dealer team, a faltering and distracted Holden Racing team, a Triple Eight team still adapting to the series, and an FPR team still not yet ready for prime time. Before the endurance races in 2006, he had only five podiums and was winless. Mark Scaife had won seven races, but his engine package was lacking and he'd had an insane amount of retirements and poor finishes. Jason Bright, Garth Tander and Craig Lowndes also had multiple wins, with Lowndes holding a 200 point lead over the dealer team duo of Rick and Tander. What hadn't been called to attention though, and what would soon come to light, was Rick Kelly's consistency. What he lacked in pure pace, he more than made up for in consistency, maintaining his car's condition expertly in order to survive. He managed second placings at both endurance events, driving with his brother Todd, but Lowndes' third at Sandown and his famous Bathurst win cancelled this advantage out. Rick then kept on keeping on, stringing 10 top 6 finishes together, including the endurance races, and before the final round, he managed a 7 point lead. Lowndes then beats Kelly by one position in each of the first two races, despite HRT and dealer team drivers acting as Kelly's rear gunners. And now we come to race 34. Lowndes is on 3,258 points. Kelly is on 3,258 and 58 points. They start next to each other. You couldn't have scripted a better finale. The lights go out, and the biggest battle this racetrack has ever seen begins, and ends four corners later. What this train wreck and its subsequent outcry even to this day overlooks was Kelly's skill. Many people see the 2006 championship decided purely by this incident, and it certainly doesn't help that he knocked out the most popular driver since Brock. But the 2006 title was decided by a maturity that had to be fast-tracked by two half-dissolutions of race teams, and by the weight of expectation poured upon a boy whose seat at a great team was really just a matter of circumstance. He had become the only ever champion to not either win a pole position or a fastest lap in their championship year, just because he was that reliable with his racecraft. 
he was on the verge of forging a great and successful career, the Australian motorsport world at his feet. And then it all just fell apart. The point system changed again for 2007, this time rewarding race winning results over consistency. Garth Tander won the championship the next year over Kelly and the 888 Fords in dominating fashion. Kelly finished no lower than fourth over the first 17 races, but only won two of them. He only failed to finish once, but sadly, it was Bathurst. In 2008, as Garth Tander left for greener pastures, the dealer team declined sharply. Kelly again started with super consistency, but as the team's position grew more insecure, so too did their performances suffer. The withdrawal of a main sponsor, Opez Prime, doomed the team, even though Kelly won in what would prove to be the HSV dealer team's final ever race. Kelly Racing, formed from the ashes of the dealer team and Larry Perkins' team, saved the Kelly brothers' careers, but it also killed them. The inherited Perkins cars were nothing special, and running four cars as a new team proved to be spreading the team too thin. Jack Perkins and Dale Wood began a running theme of inadequacy in the third and fourth Kelly Racing seats that would last for the next 10 years, while Todd would only finish in the top 15 of the championship once in his final nine seasons, as the burdens of team ownership overcame him, much as it had done to Mark Scaife, his former HRT teammate. Rick's sole win was a qualifying race at Phillip Island in his first two years, before kickstarting his career with a three-win 2011 season. The old Rick was back, sixth place with the highlight being a triple crown at Sandown. Murphy and Reynolds also proved good highs in the third and fourth seats, but then the new regulations hit Kelly Racing, and it hit hard. The 2012 season was meant to be a temporary hit on the team so that they could prepare their new Nissan Altima car for the car of the future regulations in 2013. But Dave Reynolds had gone and was on fire at FPR. His replacement in Rindler, well, caught fire. Rick really suffered as well. It was his first full-time season without a podium, even including his debut season and his lowest championship finish for a decade. But the Ultima and being Nissan's factory team would make things better, right? Nope. Kelly fought manfully against the car whose problem was at first a lack of power. Once this was sort of addressed, the gutless motor was found to have been hiding serious aero and chassis issues. It took Rick two and a half years to score a podium, and to make matters worse, he had another two and a half year drought immediately after that. In three of the six years the Ultima has been in action, he has been the highest placed Nissan. His talent was still there, but was being smothered by potentially the worst car of the future era car, and the burdens of team leadership. The wisecracks and debating about Honda Corner 2006 had faded. He was irrelevant. Not good enough to be notable, but not bad enough to be scrutinised. Then, it happened. Winton, 2018. Nissan man Michael Caruso was setting the benchmarks. He and Rick qualified third and fourth. They'd shown pace at Phillip Island, with Rick breaking his podium drought with a second and third place. But they didn't really look like winning there. But in Winton, the DJR cars go backwards, and Rick is able to weather a late storm to outrace a pacey field to win for the first time in seven years. It was amazing, and it showed that, given a good car, the boy-faced man still had the talent. He'd even managed to secure another pole position in Darwin. And then, it faded. Almost as quickly as it had come. The string of top tens ended in a podium at the new Talem Bend track, with nothing following it. In the 39 races that followed, only 7 top tens resulted, relegating Rick to 17th in the championship, his worst ever finish, yet somehow he managed to be second best of the Ultima squad. Kelly Racing admitted defeat on the Ultima project in late 2019, switching to the Mustangs which had carried Scott McLaughlin to a runaway title victory, as well as powering five of the next eight positions in the championship. Following two decades in Holden's and Nissan's, can the Mustang finally allow Rick Kelly to showcase his ability after 12 years in the doldrums? Much as Scott McLaughlin risked his career by moving to DJR when they may not have been ready, much as Craig Lowndes joined a short rise Gibson squad, much as Greg Murphy thought PWR would beat the dealer team, Rick Kelly had confidence in his family-run operation. 
As it turns out, he was wrong. But do we tarnish his legacy because of one bad choice, especially when it, in a way, still allowed him to prove his skill? In quite a similar mould to James Courtney, if he was given a decent ride, there's every chance Rick could have doubled his tally of wins, and he's the chance to prove it in 2020. As it is though, pure statistics make a great driver seem very average. Rick Kelly should not be the underrated champion. He should be regarded as an equal to Russell Ingall, James Courtney, John Bow, and others who won a singular title among poor career decisions as a champion, a worthy champion, and a driver of a level to match.